Hi, my name is Chris Waddellis, and in this presentation, I'm going to provide an overview of the ways in which boreal woodland caribou are incorporated into FSC Canada's National Forest Management Standard. The objectives of this presentation are to develop an in-depth understanding of the caribou indicator, to develop an appreciation of other aspects of the standard that relate to caribou, and to emphasize supporting content that is vital to implementing the standard. I'm actually going to talk about the supporting content first because it's important um, context for some of the topics that follow and also because it's important in a general way to provide an understanding of some of the key constructs and concepts in the standard. So the supporting content I'm going to talk about is the glossary, intent boxes and the standards annexes. So here on the screen is a definition of principle 6 as it appears in the standard. I'm not going to read it, but it's notable when you see it written that many of the words are identified in italics and followed by an asterisk. So this means that these words or terms are defined in the glossary. This type of notation is a bit distracting sometimes but when you're reading the standard, but it provides a persistent reminder of the importance of the glossary. So I am somewhat oddly fond of the glossary. I think it's a really important piece of the standard. It provides definitions for about 190 terms, and it's really important to have a precise understanding of what is meant by these terms so that the standard and its indicators can be implemented as intended and consistently by all users. So here on this page is one piece of the glossary, just the page that, of some of the terms that begin with the letter C. So look at the important terms that are defined just on this one page. Consensus, conservation area network, critical habitat, really important concepts that are used in many places through the standard. The definitions can be nuanced and critical, such as the difference between interested, interested stakeholder and affected stakeholder, expert, independent expert, qualified specialist. These are all terms from the, like a, from the same family but have nuanced differences. What's the difference between near-term and long-term? The definitions attempt to provide fairness and consistency so that all users can use them in the same manner. The definitions were derived from many sources, including the experiences of those who had worked with implementation of Canada's four previous regional standards, and they learned from the experience of having inexact definitions in the glossary how important it was. Another piece of the supporting content of the standard that I think is really important are the intent boxes. There are more than 100 of them in the standard. Some are associated with principles or criteria, but most are associated with individual indicators. They are intended to clarify the rigid language of the indicators. Auditors are required to audit to the strict or terse language of the indicators, but often as a function of their terseness, there is interpretation or explanation required so that the indicators can be applied consistently and as intended. And that's the function of the intent boxes. So here is a snippet of an intent box from the caribou indicator that explains how to deal with circumstances when a single management unit extends into more than one caribou range, a relatively common occurrence. The intent box explains that so that everyone uses the same approach. So in general, Indicators, in combination with the intent box, should provide clear and reasonable expectations so that the auditors can audit appropriately and so that forest managers understand their obligations. Another aspect of the supporting content of the standard are the annexes. There's a lot of them, and I'm not going to go through them now, um, but you should know that they exist and appreciate that they are to be used as additional references and sources of direction when implementing the standard. So now I'm actually going to talk about the caribou in the standard. Uh, first a bit of background, and then I'll talk about the caribou indicator itself, and then on to other parts of the standard that may have an impact on caribou habitat. In this presentation, you'll hear me make reference to three important documents that portray the recent thinking about boreal caribou ecology and management. These are the 2011 
scientific assessment to inform the identification of critical habitat by Environment Canada, the 2012 recovery strategy and uh, update from 2019, and the 2016 range plan guidance document. This slide and the next couple just provide some context into understanding the key scientific basis of the caribou indicator. So this graph is taken from Environment Canada's 2011 scientific assessment of critical habitat. It shows the relationship between total habitat disturbance on the x-axis and mean recruitment measured as cows, calves per 100 cows on the y-axis. So disturbance here on the x-axis includes both fire or natural disturbances and anthropogenic disturbances such as roads, linear rights of way, and forest harvesting. Um, however, this relationship is most strongly influenced by anthropogenic disturbance, much more so than by fire. So this graph shows that there is a striking and strong relationship that has, it shows a negative association between disturbance and recruitment. There are lots of interesting nuances to this work, such as definitions of disturbance, use of buffer zones. Uh, to get a better explanation of these, refer to the scientific assessment document. The same data that was used to produce the previous graph is the basis of this relationship that shows a disturbance-based population growth function with levels of total disturbance on the x-axis and the probability of observing a stable or positive growth over a 20-year period on the y-axis. So the scientists who developed the Federal Recovery Strategy identified as an acceptable benchmark achieving a 60% probability of population growth or stability. And this equates to a 35% level of disturbance. So this is very much a risk management approach. Even with disturbance limited to 35% at the range level, the probability of population stability is only 60%. So this 35-60 um, relationship is a key component of two of the three options of the caribou indicator that I'm going to talk about in a while and has implications for the third as well. So finally on to the caribou indicator itself. So as most of you probably know there are three ways or options for achieving conformance with the caribou indicator. Option A is based on the range plan guidance that I referred to earlier. Option B is based on a risk management approach, and the hallmark of option C is its collaborative approach. Option A, or the range plan guidance, is actually the simplest of the three options in that it pretty much requires adhering to the direction of um, Environment Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada's range plan guidance document. It requires that caribou habitat management be undertaken in a manner consistent with the content, measures, and objectives identified in the range plan guidance. It specifically identifies requirements related to three aspects of caribou management. So habitat, population, and engagement. Logically, most of the requirements relate to habitat not only because that's the, of the key relationship between habitat and recruitment described earlier, but because obviously habitat is the main manner in which forestry affects caribou through affecting habitat change. The habitat requirements specifically mentioned in the indicator require an assessment of current habitat, critical habitat and disturbance levels, identification of important habitat and landscape features, habitat management measures that will support self-sustaining populations, a demonstration of how at least 65% undisturbed habitat can be maintained over time in the monitoring of habitat condition. There's only one population requirement, and that is uh, to conduct an assessment of the status of population on the range in the management unit. And for engagement, the requirement of the indicator is a bullet point that uh, specifies the incorporation of Indigenous peoples' knowledge. Um, however, it should be noted that the range plan guidance itself requires that jurisdictions should apply the appropriate level of cooperation with Indigenous peoples as they would in any other resource management planning process that is undertaken within their province or territory. So this simple bullet point requirement in the indicator does not excuse the broader obligation
which is explained more fully in the range plan guidance. It's also worth noting that uh, when the indicator was being crafted, there was some uncertainty about the extent to which range plans as envisaged in the range plan guidance would actually be developed and implemented. However, over the last year or so and continuing even now, is the development of conservation plans as empowered by Section 11 of the Species at Risk Act between the federal government and the provinces that specifically require the development and implementation of range plans. And so this option, option A, of the indicator may turn out to be the selected one more commonly than originally thought. It's useful to review the circumstances that relate to planning that will by themselves not meet the requirements of this indicator. So the first bullet point addresses provincial direction. This is topical because there are circumstances in which provincial direction requires harvesting of forests in large blocks, sometimes in the thousands of hectares. So the logic of this approach is that by harvesting in large blocks, large areas of mature forest suitable as caribou habitat will be available in the future. This approach in itself is not sufficient to meet option A. Option A and the range plan guidance require a demonstration of how at least 65% undisturbed habitat will be achieved and maintained. So the two approaches, so that is harvesting in large contiguous blocks and the maintenance of a 65-35 split are not necessarily inconsistent, but in order for the blocking approach to meet the requirements of this option, it must also be accompanied by a direction that addresses the maintenance of a 65-35 split, so keeping 65% undisturbed habitat. The second bullet point notes that the simple existence of a Section 11 agreement by itself is not sufficient, nor obviously is the commitment to develop a range plan. And the mere existence of a range plan is also not sufficient. Implementation is the key to this indicator. So the only circumstance in which this indicator can be achieved is through implementation of a range plan consistent with range plan guidance. Option B is the risk management approach and it requires progressively more stringent management response to circumstances that are dependent on three independent variables, the first of which is range population status. The second independent variable is range risk category or habitat condition expressed as the percent of range that is disturbed. So these three independent variables and the benchmarks of each of them that influence the management requirements are captured in this table. So here we see range status is characterized as either stable or increasing or decreasing or unknown. Range risk category, the second independent variable, has three benchmarks, low being less than 20%, moderate being between 20 and 35 percent, and high being greater than 35 percent. And the third independent variable is management unit disturbance category, and the benchmarks there are either above or below 35 percent. So how this works is that depending on where the management unit sits based on the combination of these three benchmarks, you identify what cell in this table the management unit is in. And then the management obligations are identified by the number or the numbers in the cell. So for example, if the management unit is in the relatively benign circumstance of having a stable or increasing population, low disturbance on the range and less than 35% disturbance on the management unit, the obligation associated with requirement number one is required and that is just to implement carefully planned forest management that follows a precautionary approach. But as circumstances become more serious or dire, as these arrows show, the obligations become increasingly stringent. So for example, if circumstances comparable to the previous example prevail, except that management unit condition has disturbance of greater than 35%, the obligations include the requirement to manage access so as to minimize impacts on caribou habitat. 
And as the next three slides show, the requirements become generally greater in number and definitely more stringent as circumstances in the management unit and range become less favorable. So I'm not going to read all the requirements, but I urge you to read the intent box associated with this option 645B and all of the caribou indicator for that matter. As there is valuable information there explaining the rationale for the requirements and assistance in interpreting them. I would like, however, to specifically mention a couple of the requirements. So requirement number four relates to obligations regarding the maintenance of undisturbed portions of the range. This occurs in a number of uh, cells. It requires a long-term commitment to maintaining at least half of the present undisturbed habitat, and this will obviously require significant planning efforts. It also requires that the level of disturbance in the remaining areas can only increase in the near term when as part of a broader perspective that includes a shift to less than 35% at the management unit level in the coming 30 to 50 years. So these are pretty significant requirements. I also want to draw attention to requirement six, which requires simply that habitat restoration is in progress. The interpretation of habitat restoration as provided in the intent box is the process of returning habitat to a condition suitable for caribou use and or a state comparable to its condition prior to disturbance. The ultimate intent of habitat restoration is the recovery and persistence of caribou populations. So the notable point here is that the indicator describes the process in general and what, end point and what the endpoint should be, but it's not prescriptive about the type of management practices that should be implemented. So therefore, forest managers are empowered to implement appropriate measures to be consistent with the process of returning habitat to a condition suitable for habitat for caribou use without necessarily adhering to prescriptive methodological requirements. The last point I want to draw to your attention about option B is its reference to extraordinary measures. So in a footnote to the main table and as explained in the intent box, if a population is stable or increasing due to extraordinary measures such as predator control or maternal penning, and the requirements associated with the status of decreasing or unknown should be implemented. This is not intended to cast aspersions on or affect decisions about whether or not to implement extraordinary measures, but merely to recognize that the results of such measures while they are being implemented may give an inaccurate impression of the state of caribou circumstances on a forest and that the more stringent requirements associated with uh, range population status of decreasing or unknown should be implemented. The third option, or option C of the indicator, is a collaborative approach. This approach has some similarities with option A, the range plan guidance approach, but has two key different overarching qualities. The first is obviously the fact that it requires a collaborative process that includes the involvement of self-identified interested and affected stakeholders and affected Indigenous people. There's important information in the intent box associated with this requirement. The intent box says this approach requires that engagement be undertaken with self-identified stakeholders and affected Indigenous people. Efforts to engage could include contacting stakeholders with a history of FSC involvement and or interest in conservation and informing them of the opportunity to participate. Stakeholders who express an interest are self-identified. There is no obligation for the organization to engage stakeholders who do not express an interest. There has also been some uh, concern expressed about this resulting in an unwieldy process that has too many participants. So the intent box addresses this as well. It says, it's reasonable that the organization in collaboration with stakeholders and indigenous peoples develop a process for efficient cooperation that may involve delegation of representation across groups that share common interests. The second key quality is the explicit incorporation 
of the role of best available information and science in supporting habitat and population management. This approach opens the door to new science, but the bar is high. It must be peer-reviewed, and it must obviously still consist of management measures that will support self-sustaining caribou populations that protect critical habitat. As I noted earlier, there are some similarities between this option and option A, which is based on range plan guidance. So in the next series of slides, they highlight some aspects of the comparison between the two approaches. Regarding Indigenous peoples, the requirement of option C is to incorporate respect for and effective engagement of Indigenous peoples which is quite a bit more expansive than the requirement of option A, which is to incorporate Indigenous people's knowledge. Regarding stakeholders, option C requires the incorporation of knowledge from stakeholders, where stakeholders are not mentioned in option A. For disturbance, option C opens the door to incorporating a threshold informed by experts to achieve a self-sustaining population. This is more flexible than the requirement of option A, uh, which follows the range plan guidance 65% threshold. There are a series of other habitat related measures for option C that are the same as for option A. Option C requires an assessment of the population status in the management unit only, whereas option A requires it for the management unit and the range. And option C requires an evaluation of socioeconomic impacts, and this is not addressed at all in option A. So in sum, option C builds upon or expands on option A in some important ways. It provides a careful opportunity for new science. It has explicit engagement requirements. So it's sort of like the benefit of providing an opportunity for new science is accompanied by the obligation of broadening the engagement requirements. Option C also recognizes that there may be socioeconomic impacts, but it does not contain any obligations to incorporate a response to them if they exist. But by broaching the topic, it does provide a segue of sorts for managers to respond to. I'm just going to say a few words now about other components of the standard that relate to or may influence caribou or caribou habitat. These are Indigenous peoples' rights, conservation area network requirements, and some aspects related to large landscapes. Indigenous peoples' involvement is mentioned specifically in a couple of the caribou indicator options that I've mentioned earlier. And there is also recognition of the social and economic concerns of Indigenous people in Indicator 642 that relates to species at risk planning more generally. More broadly, however, are the rights of Indigenous people as dealt with comprehensively in Principle 3 and the topic of FPIC or Free Prior and Informed Consent that is embraced by the standard in a number of places. These rights permeate many aspects of the standard and I strongly advise you to make the time to take in the presentations that Pamela Perot has prepared on these. Criterion 6.5 relates to the development of a conservation areas network. It's a somewhat complex criterion that relies on a consensus-based process and through a number of somewhat prescriptive steps related to gap analysis, the conservation needs requires the identification of sites for which forest managers have the responsibility of working within their sphere of influence to attempt to move to regulatory status. The key point here is that there can be opportunities for overlapping accomplishments in which conservation area needs can be addressed through the identification of areas that are also important for caribou habitat. Elsewhere in Principle 6 are requirements that relate to landscape management outside of the attempts to foster the development of a conservation areas network. So the requirements in criteria 6.1 and 6.8 address identification and implementation of targets related to the maintenance of landscape conditions within a range of natural variation. And these are to include old forest habitats that are frequently important for caribou. 
indicator 683 requires that targets for the identification of the extent of forest communities also take into account the needs of species at risk that require large areas of contiguous habitat. And indicator 684 identifies measures that should be implemented to achieve these targets. I'll just say a bit about high conservation values. So uh, most people are probably aware of the concept of high conservation values or HCVs. This is one of the hallmarks of FSC system. There are six categories of HCVs and the first relates to species diversity and explicitly includes species at risk. Forest managers are required to assess the HCVs on their units and develop and implement management and monitoring strategies for all of the HCVs. Where caribou occur in a management unit, they will definitely be identified as high conservation values. But through the other requirements of the standard related to the caribou indicator and other aspects of habitat management that I've just spoken about, there should be very little, if any, additive requirements that come from the designation of caribou as an HCV. They definitely need to be identified in the assessment and management and monitoring responses need to be provided in the related principle nine criterion indicators but there should not be additive management efforts specifically associated with their designation as a high conservation value. And finally, I'll just say a few words about intact forest landscapes or IFLs. So many people probably know the history of IFLs within FSC. The obligation to incorporate them into the FSC system was passed as a policy motion at the 2014 General Assembly. And three years later, in 2017, international generic indicators related to IFLs were approved by FSC's board. And now there is an obligation of national systems, including Canada's, to incorporate indicators related to IFLs into their national standards. So this is planned for later in 2020 by FSC Canada. IFLs are large, unbroken expanses of forest, at least 50,000 hectares in size, and there will very likely be overlap between IFLs and caribou habitat. And although there's some uncertainty about the manner in which IFLs will be incorporated into Canada's standard, given the overlap in the nature of IFLs and caribou habitat, it's reasonably safe to say that the requirements should not be completely additive, and that there will be opportunities for synergy between the requirements of managing for caribou and the requirements of managing for intact forest landscapes. So finally, in summary, the key points related to the caribou indicator include that it is very much science-based and all of the three options provide a path to conformance. There is flexibility for forest managers to identify the option that best suits their circumstances and each, when implemented as intended, will safeguard caribou habitat and contribute to the return of habitat to levels consistent with self-sustaining populations. The key concepts of the indicator and other aspects of the standard uh, related to caribou habitat relate to management of disturbance, providing links between management unit and range condition, their obligations to plan and implement for caribou habitat, the need and strength associated with collaborative approaches, and the synergy between various parts of the standard in working towards improved circumstances for caribou habitat. So thanks for taking the time to view this presentation. I urge you to review the components of the standard related to caribou carefully, including the intent boxes and the terms defined in the glossary. If you have any questions, you can contact FSC at the email provided here. Thanks again and goodbye.